This is our second week in our series, Living Right in a Culture Gone Wrong. And uh, some of you are going to be challenged by what I'm going to teach. Others are going to be encouraged. Uh, Before I start, I want to thank God uh, because on Wednesday, my wife and I celebrated our 31st anniversary. Amen. So when when you see my wife... Please encourage her and say, hey, thank you for sticking with the pastor. Um, And thank you for putting up with him. Uh, Last year was our 30th anniversary, and uh, I was able to take my wife to London and to Scotland. And this year, I didn't have enough time to plan, so I just took her back to her hometown. Uh, I said, girl, you can't forget what God has done for you. So... I'm joking, but we did go back to her hometown. Uh, Yesterday, we were coming back from Mexico, and she says, you know what? I've got a 10-page paper due at 12 midnight Sunday. I said, we got to be a church girl. You're the pastor's wife. You can't be missing because of homework. (laughs) So she's coming to the evening service. If you don't see her, pray for her. She's doing a 10-page paper due by midnight today. So I get to cook. I get to eat by myself. If you got someone, you can invite Sister uh, Sandy. If you ever need to adopt someone, forget about Lupito. You can adopt me today. And she's she's. <laughs> when she says she's adopted kids, it's 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 a kids from the church that either some of them uh, have a single, uh, they come from a single mom, but some of them have both parents. But this is a way that some of the church people invest in the next generation. And uh, we have a lot of people like her that do that, that give. So some of these kids can go to retreats, to different events. So if you want to help out, uh, did they announce a youth, uh, Sammy, did they announce a youth uh, camp? They're about to have a youth camp. And my wife and I have already adopted two kids. Uh, There's this mom that comes to church. She's got about four kids. And my wife is going to pay for one of them. And I'm going to pay for the other one. So I need your help, so pay for them. Last week, we started this series based on the book of Daniel. If you have your Bible, you can open up to Daniel chapter 4. And we talked about how to live right in a culture gone wrong. Now, last week, I told you that the book of Daniel is based on, uh, on the person obviously named Daniel. He was 16 years old. Now, this is the amazing thing about Daniel. He didn't have a pastor around. He didn't have a life group. Daniel couldn't go to a youth retreat. Daniel couldn't go to a youth camp. He was living in a different culture, in a different country. He was taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. History doesn't say, but we don't know if his parents were killed when Nebuchadnezzar came and took control of Jerusalem, destroyed Jerusalem. Obviously, he killed some Jews. We don't know if his parents were left behind in Jerusalem. All we know is that according to Daniel chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, took some Jews from Jerusalem to Babylon. And among these Jews is a young boy by the name of Daniel. He was about 16 years old. Now, the amazing thing of the story of Daniel is not only that he become a great governor, he was a great leader. If, when you study the history of, of the full uh, book of Daniel, you're going to understand that when God has his hand on you, it don't matter if the devil wants to keep you down, the devil can never keep God's plans down for your life. Yes, yes, yes. God promoted him at, uh, time after time. And, and uh, you, will, you will see that God's plans for your life is greater than your plans for your life. Now, this is the amazing thing about Daniel. 70 years, and he never compromised his faith. Now, the amazing thing is this. Listen to this. I'm an adult. I'm 51 years old. Listen, it's not easy to keep your, your conviction And to keep your faith when you're 40, 50, we we live in a world, even as a pastor, I face temptations. This week, I told you, my wife and I were in Mexico. My youngest kid is at at the university in California. And two months ago, he was chosen with 10 of his uh, 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 classmates to go to the Sundance Festival in Utah. If you know anything about Sundance Festival, they bring some uh, some of the movies that... 
make it to the scene. Some of them are, are, are made. And, and my, my son said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm at a theater right now seeing the story of a pastor. And he told me the story. So on Friday night in Mexico, we got on Netflix and we were able to see the story of this pastor. And the, it's the story of a pastor, a very prominent pastor. He had a church of over 10,000 people. And one day, he decided to teach something different what he had taught for 25 years. He lost everything. He lost his congregation. He lost everything because suddenly he began to teach a different doctrine than what the Bible says. So what I'm trying to tell you is not something that you're going to face. It's something that all of us face. Paul told Timothy, Timothy, be careful of yourself and the doctrine that you preach. Because as a pastor, you can misguide, you can mislead people, and obviously he did it. So when I'm preaching this, I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching together to all of us. Now, the reason I tell you this also is because when, I, when my kids were about 12, 13, 14 years old, I begin to see that their hearts begin to change. My kids, I told you, the culture that we're living in is like a magnet. It will pull you. And I saw that the culture that we're living in was pulling my kids. What they were seeing next week, you're going to see how this culture throws images at you, throws music at you. Because it's not the culture, it's the spirit behind the culture. J Jesus said, the Bible says, that the God of this world is the devil. The devil will use everything that this world has, this culture has, to entice you, to mislead you, to, to sidetrack you. And I begin to see that in my children, and, and I begin to worry, God, what do I do to change the heart of my children? And honestly, as a father, I, I tried everything that I could. I, I, I tried to yell. I tried to scream. Thankfully, I didn't, I mean, I, they weren't at the age that I had to uh, physically uh, correct them because if you see my kids, both of them are taller than me and they could have whooped me. <laughs> but, but my wife and I began to say, what do we do with our kids? And, and God told me, you're not going to be able to change their heart. I don't care how much you scream. I don't care how much you preach to them because when I preach to them, they didn't have no offer to give me. Some of you got it. Some of you didn't. <laughs> so I said, God, what do I do? And God, this is, this is the only thing God told me to do. Every Monday night, for 10, 15 minutes, get the Bible and begin to read it with them. Now, this is the sad part. I was a pastor. I am the pastor. And I had never sat down with my kids when they were children to teach them the word. I had relied on the Sunday school teachers. Why am I telling you this? Don't commit the mistakes that I did, even though I was a pastor. It's not the Sunday schools, it's not the children's church teachers' responsibility to make sure that our kids believe in God and serve God. It's the parents' responsibility. <laughs> See, why, why? Because I've been here 27 years, and some parents blame the youth. Milton, you can blame Milton, he already left. <laughs> you, can, you can blame the youth director, you can blame the youth pastor, you can blame me. The truth is, is this, guys. The culture is going to try to take our children and rob the future that God has for them. So I said, God, what do I do? And God simply says, take 10, 15 minutes. I said, why 10, 15 minutes? Because he says, because you've never done it with them for about an hour. They're, they're going to get restless. They're going to get bored. So I said, hey, guys, turn off the TV. We're, not gonna, we're just going to sit down as a family and we're going to read one chapter every Monday, one chapter every Monday. Whatever y'all doing, homework, turn off the TV, finish your homework. And when they were 13, 14, 15, 16, D David, the oldest, was already 18 or 19. All we did as a family, all we did as a family, read one chapter. Everybody got two or three verses. I would get two or three verses, and then I would ask them, what do you think God is speaking to you from that Bible chapter? And David would say, you know what, right, I, I think this chapter stood out. And Lily would say this, Kayla would say this. And I said, okay. Now as a family, let's ask God to do that, fulfill that promise to correct that thing in our lives. And we only did it one chapter a week, one chapter a week. And we prayed for five, no more than five minutes. Lily would pray for Caleb. Lily would pray for uh, dude, dude. We call him dude. Dude would pray for me. I would pray. And little by little, little by little, God's word, God's spirit began to change 
the heart of my children. I can't get the credit because I tried to do it, but I couldn't. As a matter of fact, there are issues in my life that my wife could never correct. There are issues in my wife's life that I, I could never. But the, the thing is this, guys. We're living in a world gone wrong. Now, I'm not preaching. I'm not preaching this morning to people that are locked up in jail. But some of you are locked up. This morning, I want you to see how this culture has enticed us all. And some of us have drank the Kool-Aid. Some of us have drank the Kool-Aid that this culture, that this world is feeding not only us, that is feeding our kids. I told you last week, most of us parents were a little bit almost out of the woods. But there's a generation of children, your children, my children, if God tarries, Jesus tarries, I'll have grandchildren. And I don't want my grandchildren to go through the things that I went through. I, I, don't, want my ki- I don't want my grandchildren to experience drugs and, and, and to experience the heartache that I experienced. This is the truth, guys. The culture will try to change your way of thinking, your way of living, for you to conform and to adapt to what this culture is saying. So my question to you is, will you allow the culture to change you, or will you allow God and His Word to change you? So this is the story of Daniel. Now, I want you to see, I want you to see how this culture is still prevalent in our, in our world. You're going to see in a minute, we're going to go to the book of Genesis, the beginning, and they're going to read a passage in Revelation. Is at the end times, this culture. This Babylon culture is still prevalent, not only in the beginning, not at the end of the world. In 2018, you're going to see it. And there's only three ways that, 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 that Daniel says how we can overcome this culture. And that's the only way that you're going to be able to model for your kids. I, I, I love what Natasha says. I, I, I need to forgive the, the, the father of my daughter because I need to model for my daughter what forgiveness is. And this is what Christianity is all about. It's not what I preach. It's how I live. I can preach all I want to, but my kids know exactly how I live at home. Because we got to live right in a culture gone wrong. So notice what Genesis says. This is the Babylon mentality and, 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 and it's still prevalent in our culture. This is the Babylon mentality. Come on, read with me. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heaven so that we may make a name for what? For ourselves. Notice, no, notice, notice their goal. We're going to build this tower. We're going to build this skyscraper. And one version says that we can become famous so that we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, they said, otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Verse 9. This is what they called the city. They called it Babel because the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them all over the face of the whole earth. This time in Genesis, everyone spoke one language. I don't know if it was English. I don't know if it was Spanish, but they only spoke one language. And as they were building this tower, as they were building this tower, they were building it for the glory of man. They were building it to make a name for themselves. Everything that happens in your life, either you will build it to make a name for yourself, for you to get the credit, or you will turn it around to give God the credit. Who will give the credit in your life for everything, every accomplishment that you accomplish, for everything that God gives you? Will you give credit? Uh, main, will you get the credit or will you turn it around and says, God, you deserve the credit. You deserve the honor. Everything that I am, everything that I have, I owe it all to you. In this case, their attention was not focused on God. It was focused on themselves. And we're living in a time where everyone focused everything on themselves. And you're going to see it. Revelations. Chapter 17, verse 5. Now, this is the end time. This is the end time. This is during the great tribulation. John saw this, the same spirit that prevailed in Genesis, that is prevailing in our culture, is going to prevail at the end of the age. The Bible says this. 
The name written on the forehead was a mystery. Babylon, the great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Notice this, that in the end times, there is a, there is a beast called the great Babylon. And the name on the, her forehead was the great prostitute, Babylon, the great mother of prostitute, and the, domina, the, of the uh, abominations of the earth. Now, in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 47, I'm just going to read verse 8 and 10. You're on your homework, you have to read the whole chapter 47. Isaiah is describing, you're going to see what Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied 500 years before Christ. We're in year 2018 plus 500, over 2,518, this passage was written. And notice, it's the same mentality and the same language that is spoken in 2018, this Babylon mentality. And this is the Babylon model. Notice this. Verse 8 says this. Now then, listen, you lover of pleasure. Lounging in your security and saying to yourself, this is what this mentality, this is what this culture, the Babylon culture would express. Notice, they, would, they were lovers of pleasure. They launch in their security saying to yourself, notice, saying to yourself, I am and there is no, there is none besides me. I am, and there is none besides me. I will never be a widow. I will never suffer the loss of children. You have trusted. Notice it. You have trusted your wickedness and have said, no one sees me. I can do anything. My mom don't see me. The pastor doesn't see me. Hey, forget about your mom. Forget about your dad. Forget about the pastor. God sees everything you do in secret. And whatever you do in secret is going to come out in the light sooner or later. The culture that we're living in says this. I'm a lover of pleasure. I'm going to do what I want to do. Notice this. Notice this. They, they lounge in the security saying, I am. There is none besides me. No one sees me. Verse 18 says this. Verse 10. You have trusted in your wickedness and have said, no one sees me. Notice this. Your wisdom and knowledge mislead you when you say to yourself, I am and there is no one besides me. Notice this. Your wisdom and your knowledge mislead you when you say, I am and there is none besides me. So this is the model of Babylon. And this is the model of the culture that we're living in. This is the model. I am and there is no one besides me. I am. I don't need God. I don't need you. I don't need you. I am. And this is the attitude. This is the culture that we're living in. We have raised a generation of entitled children that say, I don't need mom and dad. I can do it on my own. We have raised a generation of, of, of men. Listen, listen. We have raised a generation of men that because, they're their fa because their father abandoned them and because someone rejected them, it repeats. It's a cycle. Men are leaving their families. Women are leaving their families because I am and there is no one besides me. I deserve to be happy at the expense of my children, at the expense of my wife. I don't need God. I am and there is no one besides me. Y'all are quiet this morning. <laughs> now, I want you to see how this culture elevates self and lowers God. This mentality, this mentality elevates self and it lowers God. Now, the three things that it does. It elevates and you become self-adoring. Do you think the Kardashians are the only ones that are taking selfies? Some of you don't, you're not a Kardashian, but I, I dare you open up your phone right now and see how, count how many selfies you have of yourself. Ooh, Jesus. Ooh. You, you ever notice those of us that are pretty blessed, we, we put it far so we can seem skinny? Pretty blessed. 
My wife and I were at a restaurant a couple of weeks ago. We were eating pizza somewhere downtown. We were eating pizza. There's a father and his daughter, 10-year-old girl. 10-year-old girl. I'm telling you, she took at least 50 selfies of her. And one, I, I, went, I got up and photobombed it. <laughs> She's going to look at it and say, who's this crazy guy behind me? We're living in a culture that adores self. Not only that, we're living in a culture that elevates not, uh, not only self-adoring, self-building. I don't need God. I've got an education. I've got a good job. I already have a good home. I've got it made. Why? It elevates self. And then it's self-indulging. If it feels good, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. If it feels, because culture puts you at the center, elevates us, and it lowers God. Okay? Now, this is how, the, we, how when, when we lower God, this is what happens. When we lower God, our culture begins to speak to us and says, God doesn't love you. If God loved you, why have you gone through the things that you've gone through? See, it elevates self, and it lowers God. Not only does it, the culture says, or, 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 or the devil, or the culture, God doesn't love you. God isn't for you. Now, this is the biggest lie. God wants and demands so much of you of your time. Now, please look at me. Those of you that have got kids... You do whatever you want to do with your kids. Really. But I'm seeing this. Those of you that have kids that play baseball, how many times a week? Don't, don't answer. This is just a hypothetical question. How many times a week they have to go to practice? Some of your kids that are either in dance teams or whatever, how many times do they have to go practice? You don't complain. Yes, yeah, you complain because you got to drive them there. That's the only complaint. Oh, but you want your kids to have, the, and it's good. Listen, it's nothing wrong for our kids to play and to be involved. Don't get me wrong. My kids did it. But there has to be a balance. Look, some of you only come to church on Sunday, and you want God to do a miracle in your kids. It's just like, you want all the benefits, but once a week, only give God your time. Some of you have never come on a Tuesday. Some of you don't know what prayer night is at New Life. Really, y'all pray here? You know what cuckoo is in Spanish? Come, please tell me, tell me who is the cuckoo. The boogeyman. the boogeyman. My pastor used to say that prayer is the boogeyman for us Christians. Ooh, prayer, I don't want to go. Because we're living in a culture that tells you, church, God wants too much from you. Listen, yesterday, I've got some friends, some friends, they texted us Friday night, and this is what they said. Hey, we have, we have uh, season tickets to see the Astros. We got two free tickets. We got two tickets, front row seats. We thought of you and Fina. Would y'all like to come? And I was in Mexico. I said, oh, I got to get up. I got to get up. <laughs> That's six hours from Piedras Negras to Houston. Jesus, three o'clock. And then I've got to, I got, we got to come from the retreat to hear the testimonies. And I told my wife, they're free. Praise the Lord. Oh, they're free. Praise the Lord. Oh, but that means I got to get up at six o'clock in the morning to make it to Houston by two o'clock. And then I got to pay parking. And then even though they're giving me the ticket, they're not going to pay for my hot dog. And I love the hot dogs. You notice this? I don't know about you, but I've gone, I've gone to games, and you got to pay $10 for parking. Now, I don't know about you, but I usually sit next to Jesus. I already told you all this. Way up there. I can't afford those $500 seats, but, man, you got to eat when you go to a game. So when you go to a game, I, used, I have to take off three hours early to beat the traffic in Houston. I got to pay for parking. I got to pay for the ticket. I got to pay for the hot dog, and I never complain. But when I come to church, oh, Lord, 
You got free parking. You got great music. I said, you got free parking. You got great music. But you only come on Sunday because you don't have time for God. And then y'all say, oh, we got to give another time for building for the future. But it doesn't hurt you when you're going to do your pedicure, your medicure, and your hericure. And those of you that still have hair, your hericure. Notice, listen, listen. It doesn't hurt me, really. It doesn't hurt me to, to, to pay $100, $150. But when was the last time you threw in $100? Now, we don't, I'm not talking about offering. I'm talking about how we serve God. And then we raise a generation of selfish kids. Because we, the parents, are selfish. We elevate ourselves and we lower God. Now, this is what happens in America, and this is exactly what's happening. What happened to Nebuchadnezzar is exactly what happened, is happening in the U.S. today. America has elevated self, and we have lowered God. And when you do that, you lose your mind. You lose the road. You lose the map. You become insane. Do you know that today in America there are more mental illness like never before? Do you know that today in America there's more anxiety? There's more divorce? There's more hate crimes? Because when we leave God out and we elevate self, the culture will lead us to live a life of insanity and confusion. A, a, a life of madness. People are doing things they never thought that they would do. Because when you elevate self, you expose your soul to a bad spirit. A spirit that does not come from God. And this is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. And he has a dream. Chapter 4, he has a dream. And he's troubled by this dream. And he calls Daniel in. And he says, Daniel, you know, I, I, I had this dream. And Daniel interprets the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, notice this. He gives him the interpretation. And he says, look, king, this is exactly what will happen to you if you elevate yourself and you lower God. In other words, if you become proudful, this is what's going to happen to you. Notice this. So, in other words, he was told what would happen a year later, exactly what was told to him, it happened because he elevated himself and he lowered God and he became insane and he became confused. And the Bible says this. Let's read it. The Bible says this in Daniel chapter 4, verse 24. This is the interpretation, your majesty. And this is the decree that the Most High has issued against you and against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from the people and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times or seven years will pass by you for until you acknowledge. Notice that seven times will pass by you until you acknowledge that the most high is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to whoever he wishes or whoever he wants. The command to leave the stump, because he had dreamt there was a big tree. The command to leave the stump of the tree and its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Everything will be restored to you when you acknowledge that, ki- that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, therefore, your majesty, he says, please accept my advice. Notice this. Now, Daniel says, please accept my advice. Please accept my advice. Be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by doing kind to the oppressed. It may be that your prosperity will continue. All this happened to, the, to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, say with me, twelve months a year later, a year later, notice it, a year later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, notice what he said. He said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence, 
by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. In other words, the motto is, I am and there is no one like me. This is what he's saying. It, did I not build this great Babylon? Did I not do it with my own power? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what the decree, this is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven from the people and you will live with wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass before you until, until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms of the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. He became insane because of his pride. Now, please listen to what I'm about to tell you. Daniel said... Please take my advice. He took the advice for a year. And a year later, if you don't know this, history says that he had built one of the great wonders of the world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar built them. If you go to any world museum, you will find blocks. You will find blocks because Nebuchadnezzar discovered something that all societies, all kingdoms are sooner or later destroyed. So what Nebuchadnezzar did, every building that he built, he put the seal and he, he had his seal. So there are bricks still in New York and different museums in the world that they archaeologists discovered. And they have the imprint of Nebuchadnezzar because everything that he built had, had his, his uh, print on it. So he gets up, and suddenly he begins to see everything. He says, is, is not the great Babylon that I built? Then I built it with my own power and my own strength. And suddenly there is a voice from heaven that came and says, the decree is fulfilled. Because a year later, Daniel had told him, if you allow pride, if you elevate yourself and you lower God, this is what will happen to you. You will lose your mind. You're going to become like an animal. And this is what is happening in our culture. We have a, a culture that hates, like animals, they're killing themselves, cultures against cultures, religions against religions, because when you elevate self and you lower God, you are going to lose your mind and you're going to do things that you never thought. Our kids, we expose our kids to a spirit that is greater than them, that is greater than us. Only the power of God is going to be able to help us to live right in a culture gone wrong. So this is what happened. This is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, notice this. Only God was able to restore his sanity, and only God can help you in the culture that we're living in. Only God was the only one that restored his sanity, and God is the only one that can restore your right mind. Amen. And this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. Verse 34. At the end of the time, seven years, say with me, seven years. Now, please look at this. Why did he wait seven years to acknowledge God? My question to you is, how many years are you going to allow your mindset, that the cultural mindset, control you until you finally lift up your head and acknowledge that God is the only God? That can help you and can restore you and can bless you. He waited seven years to live in this condition. Please don't let another day, please don't let another month for, go in your, uh, go continue in your life another year until you acknowledge God. Do you remember when, when, when there, there was uh, frogs in Egypt? Do you remember when frogs, there was a plague of frogs? And, and Nabuc, uh, King Pharaoh called Moses and he said, Moses... You know, pray, pray that God will do away with these frogs. And Moses says, when do you want me to pray? And he says, uh, pray tomorrow. In other words, 
Pharaoh was willing to spend another night with the frogs because if he prayed that day and he prayed that moment, God would allow the frogs to go away. How many more nights are you going to sleep with the frogs? How many more nights are you going to sleep with confusion? How many more days are you going to allow this culture to destroy the minds of your kids, to destroy your marriage? Listen, don't elevate self. Elevate God. Elevate God. Have God in your life because God is the only one that can restore sanity the bible says that god is not the god of confusion so if there's confusion in your marriage if you're dealing with confusion in your mind that's not god god is the god of peace god will put the puzzle back together when everything goes wrong Humpty Dumpty, no one can help him, but God can put your life back together again. If God was able to do it for Nebuchadnezzar, that was an evil king, he will do it for you also. He will restore your sanity. He will restore your marriage. He will restore your children. This is what God did for Nebuchadnezzar, and this is what God wants to do in April 2018 for you. Don't wait another year. Don't wait another month. Please don't wait another day. The Bible says, at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, notice this, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then, then I praised the Most High. And I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His domain is eternal, an eternal domain. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples on earth. No one can hold back his hand. No one can hold back his hand and say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my sanity will restore. Notice this. At the same time, my sanity will restore. My honor was restored. My splendor was returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors, my nobles sought me out. And I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. If God is an evil God, if God is an angry God, not only would he allow Nebuchadnezzar to live like an animal more years, he would have never restored everything Nebuchadnezzar had. As a matter of fact, when he acknowledged God, God not only restored his mind, not only restored his sanity, God gave him back everything that was his and more. So how do you overcome this culture? There's only three ways that you're going to be over to overcome this spirit, this culture. Number one, you're going to have to learn to praise God. Amen. Now, when I say praise, it doesn't mean this. Yeah! Hey! Woo! Yeah! I'm not talking about that. Because honestly, some of you scream more for your team than what you do for God. Some of you are more passionate for the Spurs. Right now, I'm not passionate. Right now, I'm not passionate. They lost. As a matter of fact, Friday, we're praying for them. Y'all Rockets fans, come help me pray for the Spurs. <laughs> See, this is what praise means. Praise means either I praise myself with what I have, or I praise God for what he has given me. Right. Notice what Nebuchadnezzar says. Isn't this the great Babylon that I built? He was praising himself. He was exalting himself. See, you have to learn to give God thanks, praise for any and everything that he does for you. Right. Let me say it again. Because only three of you heard me. You have to learn. Praise is thanksgiving and acknowledging. This is what Nebuchadnezzar said. This is what Nebuchadnezzar says. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven. And my sanity was restored. Then, then, I praised the Most High. I honored and I glorified him who lives forever. His domain is eternal domain and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Let me ask you a question. Be sincere. Does God deserve thanksgiving what he has done for you? Yes. Are you grateful for the blessings that God has given you? Is it that you have accomplished everything that you've accomplished? Or is it because of God's grace that you've accomplished what you've accomplished? 
The home that you live in, is it because of, 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 of because you're a hard worker? Yes, we have hard workers at, at New Life. If you're lazy, don't go to some other church. <laughs> Y'all should have said amen, not laugh. Thank you. But the car that you drive, do you say, ooh, look at my, look at my ride? Or do you say, I remember when I have nothing and God has blessed me with this car and God has blessed me. Let me ask. Maybe you don't have the house that you want, but you have something that you didn't have 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago. What, what, what do you have? What do you have? What do you have that you, that you did yourself? And he, you know what? Only you responded nothing. Because most of us think that we did it. That's why you were the only one in, in Miguel up there. Because all of us, the culture makes us believe that what we have is because I built it myself. It's because of my education. It's because of my skills. Who gave you your skills? Who gave you my skills? Who allows you to breathe today? That's why the Bible says anything and everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Thank him. Thank him for, for what? I don't know what car you're driving. I don't know what car you're driving, but stop complaining where you're driving. Stop complaining where you live. Stop complaining where you work and start thanking God. And tomorrow, go to work and tell your boss, hey, thank you for not firing me. Thank you for putting up with me with my attitude. Thank you for believing in me. Go home and tell your wife, hey, thank you for not divorcing me. Thank you for putting up with me. My God, I'm 51 and I'm still throwing tantrums. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? Or I'm the only one that throws tantrums. Ooh, Jesus, help me. That's why I told you in the beginning, y'all need to go and tell my wife, thank you for sticking with the pastor. Thank you for her. Because guys... When we elevate ourselves, we mess up everything. And you take God out of the picture. And some of you are raising your kids, making them believe that it's you and it's them. And you leave God out of the picture. No wonder your kids are going to become insane. Not, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about crazy. I'm telling you, there is a moment in my life I had to teach my kids everything that we have. We owe it all to God. We owe it all to God. And my kids knew that there is no way, no how that we were going to take the credit. Every time, every time God did something, it was God. It was a me. It was God. It was God. It was God. And I'm still telling you today, everything that has happened in your life, it was a me. It was God. Thank you for, for honoring me as your pastor. But I honor and I give God the praise. I give God the credit. Not unto us, but unto God. Raise up not only your head. Raise your voice. Praise God for every blessing, for every mercy, even when you messed up, even when you, and you didn't deserve it, he still was there for you. Now, some of you are like this. <laughs> That's cool. But if God has done something for you, come on, take five seconds and praise him, thank him, say, God, thank you. Hey! You might not know why I praise, because only God and me know where he has brought me through. It wasn't my good looks. It wasn't my intelligence that hey, we've done this. It's God's grace. It's God's mercy. So you got to praise God. You got to thank him. Tomorrow morning, we go back to work. Oh, no. <laughs> Say, God, thank you for Monday. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, and I will be glad in it. Don't wait till Friday. Don't wait till Friday to get your praise paycheck. Get up on Tuesday and say, oh, Lord, thank you for these children. Thank you for my wife. God, you deserve our praise. You deserve our thanksgiving. Go to work. Go to work and just, and people say, my God, this guy's crazy. He's talking to himself. No, I'm not crazy. I, I should have been crazy, but I'm, I got my sanity back when God came into my life, and I'm grateful for everything, everything that God has done for my life. I told you, I told you this, I told you this. My wife and I went to this uh, Japanese restaurant when, you know, they do those. I was thinking of getting a job there because I looked like them. And there's this little girl, there's a five-year-old girl. And when the guy did this, and she goes. And I was, I, I was more amazed at the little girl than the guy that was doing the cooking. The guy left. We thank him, and I told her father, excuse me, 
Is this the first time you bring your child here? He goes, oh, no, I bring my, I bring my wife and my child here every Friday. I said, really? I said, because she's, she's so amazed. He goes, she loves it. And I left that place. I said, Lord, I pray that I never lose my amazement of you. I pray that I go back to church even if someone doesn't clap, even if someone doesn't come to. I pray, God, that I never lose my gratitude. I pray that I never lose the focus. I pray that I never elevate myself, but that I elevate you and that I have to God. Oh, God, you've been so good. I want to have that, that amazement that that, that, that that little girl had. This, this Oh, my God, she was, she was excited. I want to never lose my excitement, my passion for you, God. So if you're going to overcome this culture, you must learn to thank God for every little thing that he does for you. The second thing, you have to learn to acknowledge God. Nebuchadnezzar said, Nebuchadnezzar said, until I raised my head and I acknowledged God, everything was restored to me. But I want you to read this verse with me. Notice what this, I love this verse. Why are you so puffed up about? Why are you so puffed? up about. Tell the person next to you, why do you have so much a big head? <laughs> now, this is the truth, guys. This is the truth. Some of us go, you ever seen someone when they walk in? They look at you like, okay, sorry. Okay. Because sometimes we walk to, into a room and we think, we think we're better than people. And I pray with that spirit never is tolerated at our church. I don't care if you're driving a BMW. I don't care if you came in roller skates. I don't care if you walk to church. You don't belong to the church because of what much you make. You belong to the church because of what he made for you and what he made for me and for you. Now, this is the truth, really. Because there, there, there comes a time that you, you look around and say, who's this guy in the street? He smells a little bit. You forgot the last time you smelled. Really. I know what I'm talking about. I pray we never have that spirit in your life. If you're lazy and you have the bad spirit, go to the church on the Causeway Bridge. There's none there. We are, what are you so puffed up about? What do you have that God hasn't given you? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, why you act as that? as though you are so great. If God has given everything that you have, why do you act as if you were so great and as though you have accomplished something on your own? T tell the person next to you, man, wh wh why do you think that you're driving what you're driving? Because you pay for it? Why do you think you got that job? You think you got it? It was God. It was God. Now listen, listen, listen. The third thing that you got to do you got to humble yourself. You, you got you to gotta develop a spirit of humility in your life. Okay? Now, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible... Nebuchadnezzar said it. Read it. Now, he said, I. Now I decide. I praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven because everything he has done is right. And all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. Now, I'm about to finish. Please listen to what I'm about to tell you. I don't deserve this. I, I don't mean this. I don't speak this over you. I don't prophesy this over you. If it happens, it's because you allowed it. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, if you elevate yourself, and if you lower God, this will, will happen to you. A year later, a year later, Nebuchadnezzar is walking. He says, isn't this the great Babylon that I built? And immediately the decree was fulfilled upon him and God humbled him. Listen to this. The Bible says that whoever elevates himself, whoever exalts himself, God will humble him. But if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. Now this is what the Bible means. This is what the Bible means. In James chapter 4 verse 10 says this. Humble yourself before the Lord. And he, not you, he will lift you up. Don't look for recognition. Don't look for the applauses of people. Look for the applause of God. Look for the uh, approval of God. 
Because listen, sooner or later, people are going to stop clapping at you. Sooner or later, people are going to abandon you. They're going to disappoint you. But God will never disappoint you. God will never disappoint you. Now, do you know why I'm telling you this? Let me tell you why I'm telling you this. I'm going to turn 52 next month. I'm going to turn 52 next month. 31 years ago, 31 years ago, I was 20 years old. And I went to Africa for the first time. I went, I spent eight weeks in, six or eight weeks in Africa. I was in Nigeria and then I was in Ghana. I had just graduated from Bible school. And when I came back for Africa, a week later, I married my wife. Soon I got, as soon as I got back from Africa, I said this. Listen to what I said. None of my classmates will leave Mexico. And here I am, 21, 20 years old. And look where I've been. Look where I've gone. You know what happened? For a year, I lost my, I lost it. In my first year of marriage, I could have lost my mind. Because pride was in my heart and in my mind. And God stopped opening doors for me. I would read my Bible. And it was like, I, I, I. Look, every time I read the Bible, God speaks to me. When I get down on my knees, I feel God's presence. For a whole year, it's like God gave his back to me. You know why? Because I became proud. Do you know in the past 27 years, I've been to almost every continent? And every time God takes me now, you know what I do? I never say, look where I've been. I say, look where God's mercy allowed me to go. Look where God's mercy allowed me to go. You hear what I'm telling you? Ten years ago after the hurricane, we took a cruise with my kids. And my kid says, my God, all those kids say that their parents are doctors or engineers. And I said, what did you tell them? I told them you were a public speaker. (laughs) I set my kids kids in that cruise. I set them down. I said, the only reason we're in this cruise, the only reason is because of God's grace and God's mercy. You might think I'm a public speaker, but I'm not a public speaker. I'm a preacher and I'm a pastor because of God's grace and God's mercy. And then I quickly told him, look, I come from families. All my uncles, I, I, I preach to I told, I, Listen, if you elevate yourself, you will lose everything that you have. But if you humble yourself, if you humble yourself, even if they don't promote you, even if you didn't get that raise, It might be 31 years, but God will give you your your degree. God will open doors for you. Don't don't, don't think it's you. Give give the credit to God. Humble yourself. Live humble. Develop a humble spirit. Don't become proudful. Love God. Love people. Don't become better. Don't you think you're better than your family member? Don't don't, don't you think you you don't need God? You don't need the church. You don't need... No, no, no. Humble yourself. If you humble yourself, sooner or later, God is going to do this for you. God is going to raise you. God is going to pick you up. And your life and your story will be a trophy of God's grace and God's mercy. And you will be able to say, it was God. It was God. I couldn't do it. I didn't deserve it. But God did it. My life, my family, it's God's grace. It's God's mercy. I didn't know how. I didn't know when. But God did it. And if you do that, believe me, God will pick you up and God will lift you up and God will raise you and God will open doors for you. You never thought that you would walk through. You will sit down with people that you never thought you could sit down and talk and eat with them. But if you become proudful, God, not God, your pride will take everything away from you. This is why this culture is losing everything. Because they have taken God out of the equation. My question to you is, how long will you continue to leave God out of your life? Nebuchadnezzar, seven years until he humbled himself. And he recognized that everything that he was and everything that he had, he owed it all to God. He owed it all to God. Listen, listen. And I pray, I pray, 
don't allow this culture to suck you in. Stop drinking the Kool-Aid. Don't elevate yourself. Don't think you can do it without God. Get the Bible. Get God back in your life. Raise your kids to believe that it's God. Teach them the Bible. Teach them that it's God's grace. Acknowledge God in your life. Everything, when God gives you a paycheck, say, God, is because of you. God, when God gives you a raise, when you get another degree, when God is going to do it, all you women that were here, my God, God is going to do so much for you, but never forget that it was God. Never forget that he healed your heart. Never forget that he restored you, because when God restores you, he never does it to take it away from you. He always does it to give you more than what you deserve and more than what you could do on your own, because that's how God is. So how grateful are you? How grateful are you? How grateful are you? How grateful are you? How how much has God done for you? How much have you thanked God? How much pride have you allowed in your mind, in your heart? Have you elevated yourself and you lower God? Are you are, are, are you exalting God more and, uh, and, 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 and decreasing yourself? What's your life? What's your life? What's my life? Every year I ask God, God, why did you do it? Why did you choose me? Why did you save me? I was no one. I said, that's why, because you were no one. I pray. I pray. Honestly, guys, this is my prayer. I pray. And my kids, my wife and my kids, anytime I get this little spirit like, oh, come, come on, sit down. Remember that story you told us? I pray that I never become proudful. And, and you will notice when I become proudful because you will notice that I start losing contact with God and with the people. That's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. He got away from people. And when you allow self, you start getting away from other people because suddenly you're better than us. I'm better than you. I don't need church. I did it on my own. I can do it on my own. That's what Nebuchadnezzar saw. Please hear me out. Don't let this culture overcome you. The only way you're going to overcome this culture is by you praising God, by you acknowledging Him, and by you humbling yourself.